Story sixteen of Abaft the Funnel by Rudyard Kipling. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story sixteen Sleipner, late Turinda. There are men, both good and wise, who hold that in a future state dumb creatures we have cherished here below will give us joyous welcome as we pass the golden gate. Is it folly if I hope it may be so? the place where the old horse died. If there were any explanation available here, I should be the first person to offer it. Unfortunately, there is not, and I am compelled to confine myself to the facts of the case as vouched for by Hordine and confirmed by Gouge, who is the last man in the world to throw away a valuable horse for nothing. Jael came up with Turinda to the Shayad Spring meeting, and besides Turinda his string included divorce, Meg's diversions, and Benoni, ponies of sorts. He won the officer's scurry, five furlongs, with Benoni on the first day, and that sent up the price of the stable in the evening lotteries, for Benoni was the worst-looking of the three, being a pigeon-toed, split-chested dack-horse with a wonderful gift of blundering in on his shoulders, ridden out to the last ounce, but first. Next day Jael was riding divorce in the waddle and daub stakes, round the jump course, and she turned over at the on and off course when she was leading and managed to break her neck. She never stirred from the place where she dropped, and Jael did not move either till he was carried off the ground to his tent close to the big Shamiana, where the lotteries were held. He had ricked his back, and everything below the hips was as dead as timber. Otherwise he was perfectly well. The doctor said that the stiffness would spread, and that he would die before morning. Jael insisted upon knowing the worst, and when he heard it, sent a pencil note to the honorary secretary, saying that they were not to stop the races or do anything foolish of that kind. If he hung on till the next day, the nominations for the third day's racing would not be void, and he would settle up all claims before he threw up his hand. This relieved the honorary secretary, because most of the horses had come from a long distance, and under any circumstance, even had the judge dropped dead in the box, it would have been impossible to have postponed the race. There was a great deal of money on the third day, and five or six of the owners were gentlemen who would make even one day's delay an excuse. Well, settling would not be easy. No one knew much about Jail. He was an outsider from down country, but every one hoped that since he was doomed he would live through the third day and save trouble. Jail lay on his charpoy in the tent and asked the doctor and the man who catered to the refreshments he was the nearest at the time, to witness his will. "'I don't know how long my arms will be workable,' said Jael, "'and we'd better get this business over. The private arrangements of the will concern nobody but Jael's friends, but there was one clause that was rather curious. Who was that man with the brindled hair who put me up for a night until the tent was ready? The man who rode down to pick me up when I was smashed. Nice sort of fellow, he seemed.' Hordine, said the doctor. Yes, Hordine. Good chap, Hordine. He keeps bull whiskey. Write down that I give this Johnny Hordine Torinda for his own, if he can sell the other ponies. Torinda's a good mare. He can enter her, post-entry, for the all-horse sweep, if he likes, on the last day. Have you got that down? I suppose the stewards will recognize the gift. No trouble about that, said the doctor. All right. Give him the other two ponies to sell. They're entered for the last day, but I shall be dead then. Tell him to send the money to blank. Here he gave an address. Now I'll sign and you sign, and that's all. This deadness is coming up between my shoulders. Jail lived, dying very slowly, till the third day's racing, and up till the time of the lotteries on the fourth day's racing. The doctor was rather surprised. Hordine came in to thank him for his gift, and to suggest it would be much better to sell Torinda with the others. She was the best of them all, and would have fetched twelve hundred on her looking-over merits only. 
"'Don't you bother,' said Jale. "'You take her. I rather liked you. I've got no people, and that bull whiskey was first-class stuff. I'm pegging out now, I think.' The lottery tent outside was beginning to fill, and Jale heard the click of the dice. "'That's all right,' said he. "'I wish I was there, but I'm going to the drawer.' And then he died quietly. Hordeen went into the lottery tent after calling the doctor. "'How's jail?' said the honorary secretary. "'Gone to the drawer,' said Hordeen, settling into a chair and reaching out for a lottery paper. "'Poor beggar,' said the honorary secretary. "'Twasn't the fault of our on and off, though. The mayor blundered. Gentlemen, gentlemen! Nine hundred and eighty rupees in the lottery, and river of years for sale!' The lottery lasted far into the night, and there was a supplementary lottery on the all-horse sweep where Terinda sold for a song, and was not bought by her owner. "'It's not lucky,' said Hordeen, and the rest of the men agreed with him. "'I ride her myself, but I don't know anything about her, and I wish to goodness I hadn't taken her,' said he. "'Oh, bosh! Never refuse a horse or a drink, however you come by them.' No one objects, do they? Not going to refer this matter to Calcutta, are we? Here, somebody bid. Eleven hundred and fifty rupees in the lottery, and Turinda, absolutely unknown, acquired under the most dramatic circumstances, from about the toughest man it has ever been my good fortune to meet, for sale. Hello, Nurji, is that you? Gentlemen, where a pagan bids, shall enlightened Christians hang back? Ten, going, going, gone. You want ha ha, sar? said the battered native trainer to Hordeen. No thanks, not a bit of her for me. The all horse sweep was run and won by Torinda by about a street and three quarters, to be very accurate, amid derisive cheers, which Hordeen, who flattered himself that he knew something about writing, could not understand. On pulling up, he looked over his shoulder and saw that the second horse was only just passing the box. Now, how did I make such a fool of myself, he said, as he returned to way out. His friends gathered around him and asked tenderly whether this was the first time that he had got up, and whether it was absolutely necessary that the winning horse should be ridden out when the field were hopelessly pumped, a quarter of a mile behind, and so on and so on. I, I thought River of Years was pressing me, explained Hordeen. River of Years was wallowing, absolutely wallowing, said a man, before you turned into the strait. You rode like a, hang it, like a militia subaltern. The Shyad Spring meeting broke up, and the sportsmen turned their steps towards the next carcase, the Goraya Spring. With them went Torinda's owner, the happy possessor of an almost perfect animal. "'She's as easy as a Pullman car, and about twice as fast,' he was wont to say in moments of confidence to his intimates. "'For all her bulk, she's as handy as a polo pony. A child might ride her, and when she's at the post she's as cute. She's as cute as the bally starter himself.' Many times had Hordeen said this, till at last one unsympathetic friend answered with, "'When a man books too much about his wife or his horse, it's a sure sign he's trying to make himself like em. I mistrust your Torinda. She's too good. Or else.' "'Or else what? You're trying to believe you like her.' "'Like her? I love her. I trust that darling, as I'm shot if I'd trust you. I'd hack her for tuppence. Hack away, then. I don't want to hurt your feelings. I don't hack my stable myself, but some horses go better for it. Come and peacock at the bandstand this evening. To the bandstand, accordingly, Hordeen came, and the lovely Torinda comported herself with all the gravity and decorum that might have been expected. Hordeen rode home with the scoffer, through the dusk, discoursing on matters indifferent. "'Hold up a minute,' said his friend. "'There's Gagley riding behind us.' Then, raising his voice, "'Come along, Gagley. I want to speak to you about the race-ball.' But no Gagley came, and the couple went forward at a trot. "'Hang it! There's that man behind us still!' 
Hordine listened and could clearly hear the sound of a horse trotting, apparently just behind them. "'Come on, Gagley, don't play Bo Peep in that ridiculous way,' shouted the friend. Again, no Gagley. Twenty yards farther there was a crash and a stumble as the friend's horse came down over an unseen rat-hole. "'How much damaged?' asked Hordine. "'Sprained my wrist,' was the dolorous answer, "'and there is something wrong with my kneecap. "'There goes my mount to-morrow, "'and this G is cut like a cab-horse.' On the first day of the Garaya meeting, Torinda was hopelessly ridden out by a native jockey, to whose care Hordine had at the last moment been compelled to confide her. "'You forsaken idiot!' said he. "'What made you begin riding as soon as you were clear? She had everything safe if you'd only left her alone. You rode her out before the home turn, you hog.' "'What could I do?' said the jockey sullenly. "'I was pressed by another horse.' whose other horse there were twenty yards of daylight between you and the ruck if you'd kept her there even then twouldn't have mattered but you rode her out you rode her out there was another horse and he pressed me to the end and when i looked round he was no longer there let us in charity draw a veil over hordine's language at this point goodness knows whether she'll be fit to pull out again for the next event damn you and your other horses i wish i'd broken your neck before letting you get up Torinda was done to a turn and it seemed a cruelty to ask her to run again in the last race of the day hordine rode this time and was careful to keep the mare within herself at the outset once more Torinda left her field with one exception a gray horse that hung upon her flanks and could not be shaken off the mare was done, and refused to answer the call upon her. She tried hopelessly in the strait, and was caught and passed by her old enemy, River of Years, the chestnut of Kurnal. "'You rode well, like a native, Hordine,' was the unflattering comment. The mare was ridden out before River of Years. "'But the grey,' began Hordine, and then ceased, for he knew that there was no grey in the race. Blue Point and Diamond Dust, the only greys at the meeting, were running in the Arab handicap. He caught his native jockey. What horse do you say pressed you? I don't know. It was a grey with nutmeg tickings behind the saddle. That evening Hordine sought the great Major Blair Tindar, who knew personally the father, mother, and ancestors of almost every horse brought from Ica or ship that had ever set foot on an Indian race-course. "'Say, Major, what is a grey horse with nutmeg tickings behind the saddle?' "'A curiosity. Wendell Holmes is a grey with nutmeg on the near shoulder, but there is no horse marked your way now.' Then, after a pause, "'No, I'm wrong. You ought to know. The pony that got you Torinda was grey and nutmeg.' "'How much?' divorce, of course, the mare that broke her neck at the Shyad meeting and killed Jail. A big thirteen-three she was. I recollect when she was hacking old Snuffy Beans to office. He bought her from a dealer who had her left on his hands as a rejection when the pink hussars were buying team up country, and then— Hello! The man's gone! Hordine had departed on receipt of information which he already knew. He only demanded extra confirmation. Then he began to argue with himself, bearing in mind that he himself was a sane man, neither gluttonous nor a wine-bibber, with an unimpaired digestion, and that Torinda was to all appearance a horse of ordinary flesh and exceedingly good blood. Arrived at these satisfactory conclusions, he re-argued the whole matter. Being by nature intensely superstitious, he decided upon scratching Torinda and facing the howl of indignation that would follow. He also decided to leave the Garaya meet and change his luck. But it would have been sinful, positively wicked, to have left without waiting for the polo match that was to conclude the festivities. At the last moment before the match, 
one of the leading players of the Garaya team and Hordene's host, discovered that, through the kindly foresight of his head sace, every single pony had been taken down to the ground. "'Lend me a hack, old man,' he shouted to Hordene, as he was changing. "'Take Torinda was the reply. "'She'll bring you down in ten minutes.' And Torinda was accordingly saddled for Marish's benefit. "'I'll go down with you,' said Hordene. The two rode off together at a hand-canter. "'By Jove! Somebody say so get kicked for this,' said Marish, looking around. "'Look there! He's coming for the mare. Pull out into the middle of the road.' "'What on earth do you mean?' "'Well, if you can take a straight horse so calmly, I can't. Didn't you see what a lather that grey was in?' "'What grey?' "'The grey that just passed us, saddle and all. He's got away from the ground, I suppose. Now he's turned the corner. But you can hear his hoofs. Listen!' There was a furious gallop of shod horses, gradually dying into silence. "'Come along,' said Hordeen. "'We're late as it is. We shall know all about it on the ground.' "'Anybody lost a tat?' asked Marish cheerily as they reached the ground. "'No, we've lost you. Double up. You're late enough as it is. Get up and go in. The teams are waiting.' Marish mounted his polo pony and cantered across. Hordeen watched the game idly for a few moments. There was a scrimmage, a cloud of dust, and a cessation of play, and a shouting for saces. The umpire clattered forward and returned. "'What has happened?' "'Marish! Neck broken! Nobody's fault! Pony crossed its legs and came down! Game stopped! Thank God he hasn't got a wife!' Again Hordeen pondered as he sat on his horse's back. Under any circumstances it was written that he was to be killed. I had no interest in his death, and he had his warning, I suppose. I can't make out the system that this infernal mare runs under. Why him? Anyway, I'll shoot her." He looked at Torinda, the calm-eyed, the beautiful, and repented. No, I'll sell her. What in the world has happened to Torinda that Hordeen is so keen on getting rid of her? was the general question. I want money, said Hordeen unblushingly, and the few who knew how his accounts stood saw that this was a varnished lie. But they held their peace because of the great love and trust that exists among the ancient and honourable fraternity of sportsmen. There's nothing wrong with her, exclaimed Hordeen. Try her as much as you like, but let her stay in my stable until you've made up your mind one way or the other. Nine hundred's my price. I'll take her at that, quoth a red-haired subaltern, nicknamed Carrots, later Gaja, and then for brevity's sake, Guj. Let me have her out this afternoon. I want her more for hacking than anything else. Guj tried Torinda exhaustively, and had no fault to find with her. She's all right, he said briefly. I'll take her. It's a cash deal. Virtuous Guj, said Hordeen, pocketing the check. If you go on like this, you'll be loved and respected by all who know you." A week later Goodge insisted that Hordeen should accompany him on a ride. They cantered merrily for a time. Then said the subaltern, "'Listen to the mare's beat a minute, will you? Seems to me that you've sold me two horses.' Behind the mare was plainly audible the cadence of a swiftly trotting horse. "'Do you hear anything?' said Goodge. No, nothing but the regular triplet, said Hordeen, and he lied when he answered. Guge looked at him keenly and said nothing. Two or three months passed, and Hordeen was perplexed to see his old property running and running well under the curious title of Schleipner, late Torinda. He consulted the great major, who said, I don't know a horse called Schleipner, but I know of one. He was a northern bred, and belonged to Odin. A mythological beast? Exactly, like Bucephalus and the rest of them. He was a great horse. I wish I had some of his get in my stable. Why? Because he had eight legs. When he had used up one set, he let down the other four to come up the straight on. Stewards were lenient in those days. Now it's all you can do to get a crock with three sound legs." 
for dean cursed the red-haired gudge in his heart for finding out the mare's peculiarity then he cursed the dead man jael for his ridiculous interference with a free gift if it was given it was given said hordene and he has no right to come messing about after it when gudge and he next met he inquired tenderly after Turinda. the red-haired subaltern impassive as usual answered i've shot her well you know your own affairs best said hordene you've given yourself away said gudge what makes you think i shot a sound horse she might have been bitten by a mad dog or lamed you didn't say that no i didn't because i've a notion that you knew what was wrong with her wrong with her she was a sound as a bell i know that don't pretend to misunderstand you'll believe me and i'll believe you in this show but no one else will believe us that mare was a bally nightmare go on said hordene i stuck the noise of the other horse as long as i could and called her sleipner on the strength of it sleipner was a stallion but that's a detail when it got to interfering with every race i rode it was more than i could stick i took her off racing and on my honour since that time i've been nearly driven out of my mind by a grey and nutmeg pony it used to trot round my quarters at night fool about the mall and graze about the compound you know that pony it isn't a pony to catch or ride or hit is it no said hordene i've seen it so i shot Torinda. that was a thousand rupees out of my pocket and old stiffer who's got his new crematorium at full blast cremated her i say what was the matter with the mare was she bewitched hordene told the story of the gift which gudge heard out to the end now that's a nice sort of yarn to tell in a mess-room isn't it they'd call it jumps or insanity said gudge there's no reason in it it doesn't lead up to anything it only killed poor marish and made you stick me with the mare and yet it's true are you mad or drunk or am i that's the only explanation can't be drunk for nine months on end and madness would show in that time said hordene all right said gudge recklessly going to the window i'll lay that ghost he leaned out into the night and shouted jail 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 wherever you are there was a pause and then up the compound drive came the clatter of a horse's feet the red-haired subaltern blanched under his freckles to the colour of glycerin soap Torinda's dead he muttered and and all bets are off go back to your grave again hordene was watching him open-mouthed now bring me a straitjacket or a glass of brandy said gudge that's enough to turn a man's hair white what did the poor wretch mean by knocking about the earth don't know whispered hordene hoarsely let's get over to the club i'm feeling a bit shaky End of story 16